peace from God our Father and from our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ. Amen. We've all experienced that. I'm talking about those times when, when life seems to just go out of control. A young child is brutally murdered. A friend of ours develops terminal cancer. A long-time relationship crumbles. Suddenly someone that we love dearly dies. We lose a job. We face financial resource, uh, uh, reversals. Those times when everything seems to go wrong in our life. And at times like that, we're tempted to ask the question, where is God in all of this? Well, today, in that first lesson, the story of Joseph, we hear an answer. He tells us in that first lesson that God is right there in the middle of all of that mess. And that God uses the stuff that happens. He uses it to bring about an ultimate blessing, an ultimate good to his children. And his example, Joseph's example, points us to the providence of God and to the grace of God. Listen again to a portion of that first lesson. When Joseph's brothers saw that their brother, father was dead, they said, it may be that Joseph will hate us and pay us back for all the evil that we did to him. So they sent a message to Joseph saying, your father gave this command before he died. Say to Joseph, please forgive the transgressions of your brothers and their sin because they did evil to you. Joseph wept when they spoke to him. His brothers also came and fell down before him and said, behold, we are your servants. But Joseph said to them, do not fear. For am I in the place of God? As for you, you meant evil against me, but God meant it for good, to bring about that for many people, that many people should be kept alive as they are today. So do not fear. I will provide for you and your little ones. And so he comforted them and spoke kindly to them. Joseph's brothers were an anxious lot. Ever since they had met up with Joseph after that long absence, those years of separation, they had been concerned about payback, about retribution. Though Joseph had never given any indication that he was vindictive, his brothers thought they understood human nature. They understood what they were like. Offenses you don't forget. People don't actually forgive and forget at all. What goes around is always going to come around. And the only reason they concluded it hadn't come around to them was because their father was still alive. And Joseph loved his father. But now, dad was dead. Wouldn't the day of retribution be just around the corner? The brothers acted quickly. They came to Joseph with a message from their dead father. Was it real or was it just something they made up? The Bible doesn't tell us, but the message was simple. Please forgive your brothers. And the Bible says, and Joseph wept. He saw what was behind that message and he was hurt. He was hurt because for all of this time, his brothers had not trusted him. They had not taken his word of love and his word of forgiveness at face value. And so Joseph gathers the brothers together. And we hear the words of, from this text. Joseph says, don't be afraid. Am I in the place of God? You indeed intended, intended to harm me, but God intended it for good to accomplish what is now being done, the saving of many lives. 
Joseph contends that God was right in the midst of his life. He was at hand right there. He was guiding the circumstances of his life and he was using everything, the good and the bad, everything that occurred for his good and for the good of other people. Being sent as a young man by his father to find his brothers, being sold into slavery by those jealous brothers, being purchased as a slave by Potiphar, being accused by Mrs. Potiphar of rape, imprisoned then with the baker and the cup baker, cup, uh, the, the cup bearer, and then elevated by Pharaoh to become the prime minister of Egypt. God was using all of that stuff. Yes, you may have intended it for evil. Potter's wife may have wanted to get back at me. But God was in the midst of it, using even the bad stuff to accomplish his purposes in my life. That, Joseph says, is how God acts. Now, how God acts. That's God's grace at work. That's his providence at work. You intended to harm me, but God intended to use it for good to accomplish that which is being done, the saving of many lives. When we talk about God's providence at work, there are some important issues that I think we need to be very, very clear about. And the first is that evil is real. In no way are we saying that because God used what these brothers did for good, that that somehow excuses the brothers or, or makes what they did okay. You intended to harm me, Joseph says. Those brothers sinned. They did what was contrary to God's will and to God's way, and they are responsible before the Almighty God for that sin. But what Joseph is saying here is that God took their evil and he used it for their good. When people commit terrorist acts, as just happened recently in London, when one person abuses another, when drug peddlers peddle death to others, when God's standards are laughed at and ridiculed, these are evil acts. And one day, these people will stand before the righteous judge and have to give an account of their wickedness. We heard that today in the second lesson. Let's not forget that evil is real and that real people can and they do evil things. You see, God didn't create people to be puppets on a string. He gave humanity a measure of freedom and right from the very beginning, after the fall, people began to use that freedom to do evil and they're still doing it. Remember Cain and his brother Abel and what he did? That was just the beginning. Evil is real, and so, my friends, is God's judgment upon evil. That is one truth that the scriptures teach to us. But there's another truth, and that God in his mercy uses the free acts of people, howbeit evil, in order to accomplish his purpose. Now, you think about that. And you realize that that's exactly what God did in Jesus Christ. He took the evil of humanity that was meted out on his own dear son, that crown of thorns, the beating and the suffering and the agonizing crucifixion and death. He used that as a means to bring about the greatest good for the whole world. He used it to destroy the power of sin and death and to give to all of us who come to him forgiveness of sins, life and salvation. Talk about using the evil acts of humanity to accomplish his good. Good for you and for me, our eternal good. Evil is real, that's point one. And point two, so are the pain and the heartaches that result from it. 
Believing in God's providence doesn't mean that you're not going to experience evil or pain or hurt that comes because of it. During the difficult times in Joseph's life, you can bet that he experienced He experienced times of discouragement and frustration and, and maybe even anger. Just imagine what it would be like to, to be sold by your family members, to be falsely accused of abuse, to be forgotten by the people who mean everything to you. I just can't imagine what that would do to my insides. No, believing in God's providence doesn't mean that you're not going to feel the pains that are part of living in a sinful world. You most certainly will. And that's what Jesus means when he says, in this world, you will have trouble. But then he adds this gracious word. But I have overcome the world. And today we hear a second word. And I will use the pain and the hurt, indeed all of those things, for the good of my children. That's God's promise to you. St. Paul put it this way. He said, in all things, we know that God works for the good of those who are his children, those who have been called according to his purposes. I want you to know that God is not indifferent to what we experience. Sometimes I think we feel that God is far away, too far away to even realize what's happening to us. We, we pray and, and we feel that God just isn't listening. Don't trust how you feel. Trust God. Trust in his word and in his promise. I want you to know that the God who loved this world so much that he sent his one and only son, that God, the God who permitted humanity to whip and beat him and to hang him on the cross to die, the God who permitted all of this to happen so that he could forgive your sins, that God cares about you and about your future. He does. And he's determined to have you with him in eternity. That's how much he loves you. And you can be sure that he is going to use everything, the good and the bad, to get you there. He will use all for your good. You can trust him to do that. That's his promise. God is working all things for the good of his children. Notice that Paul does not say God uses the nice things for the good of his children. Nor does it say God uses some things for the good of his children. It says God is working all things for the good of those who are his children. That's God's word. That's his promise. And by the spirit of God, you can know it and you can believe it and you can live by it. What does it mean to live under the providence of God? First of all, it means that we can view life from a different perspective. Remember when they had that carpet here and the mess on the bottom and the word life on the top? We can view life from the perspective of eternity. And we can learn to say, I consider that the sufferings of this age are not worthy to compare to the glory that is to be revealed. You cut off eternity from the perspective of life, and life can just become a meaningless ribble. Eternity adds a divine factor. The presence and the action of a gracious and a loving Father who promises to walk with you through the good and through the bad. Fear not, I have redeemed you, God says. I have called you by name, you are mine. And so when you pass through the waters, I will be with you. And when you pass through the rivers, they will not sweep over you. Second, living under the providence of God frees you to look beyond the pain and to anticipate what God is going to be doing. Rather than assuming that God must have deserted me, we oftentimes think that way. 
we can know and stand on the truth that God is working for our good. And so we can view every circumstance as God's opportunity to be acting for us and for our opportunity to grow in Him. Indeed, it frees us to ask the question when difficult times come, I wonder how God is going to be using this for my eternal good. And finally, living under the providence of God frees us to act. People are oftentimes paralyzed when it comes to making decisions and choices in life. They say that that is a particular problem of, of, of uh, the millennial group today. What if I make the wrong decision? What if I mess up? Well, what if you do mess up? What's going to happen? What have we been saying this morning? God uses all things. Even our messing up the wrong decisions that we make for our eternal good. That's God's promise. And that frees us to make our decisions, trusting that with God's help, we'll make the right ones. But God forbid we make the wrong one. We can be assured that God is using that too. Well, that's what it means to live under a gracious and a loving God in Jesus Christ. This is the God who has overcome the world. This is the God who has overcome sin and overcome death and the power of the devil through the life and death and resurrection of Jesus Christ. And this God has a personal interest in you. He loves you with an everlasting love. And as with Joseph, this God will use all things, all things, for your good too. You can believe it. It's God's promise. It's true. Amen. And now may the peace of God that passes all our understanding keep your hearts and minds centered in Christ Jesus.